very clear. Thank you. Very clear. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet all of you. Just to introduce myself again, my name is Jeffrey Suryadi. I am part of the 2017 batch in Business International University, majoring in International Accounting and Finance. First of all, thank you, Sir Iksan, and also Ms. Palen, and also Ms. Yanti for inviting me to be a guest lecturer for this session. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. And then I want to share a little bit about my experience in the digital banking industry, uh, particularly on why I decided to have a career in this industry and what do I do so far in my day-to-day -day work. And currently, my position in BBS is as the DigiBank Business Planning Manager. Hopefully, you will be able to get something from this session, uh, both to open your mindset and also to help your future career later. So let's start, yeah? I think to start off this sharing session, I think it will be good as well to discuss about my career path. As I explained before, I graduated from Business International University back in 2017. When I finished my thesis, I only have one goal and one goal in my mind. It is to have a successful career in the banking industry. After going through a careful consideration, uh, I finally decided to have a career in the DBS bank, whereby I decided to join the DBS Management Associate Program. This is a two-year rotation program, whereby I got the opportunity to rotate within five different divisions within DigiBank, within DBS, whereby I got the opportunity to enter the strategic and planning team, and then the corporate banking, treasury and markets, uh, consumer banking, as well as the risk management. I was involved as well in several big projects. For example, when uh, DBS is acquiring INZ, I was part of the team who do the, uh, who do the movement between INZ to DBS. And then I also involved in launching one of the most important products inside the DigiBank, which is the DigiBank KTA. For all of you who are not familiar with the terms of KTA, KTA actually refers to unsecured loan. It is a form of loan that are being provided by banks whereby customer can get the loan without any collateral. And then to cut the story short, after the rotation program, I got a permanent placement as a DigiBank KTA Process Improvement Specialist. In this specific role, my main aim is actually to ensure that the customer journey in the, inside the DigiBank KTA product will be as perfect as possible. And I'm also responsible to solve any production issues, uh, any production defect that may happen when customer face any issue in the production environment. After that, uh, I got promoted as the DigiBank Business Planning Manager. That is a role that I'm currently filling in. So even after all this introduction, there is uh, one very important question that needs to be answered as well. It is why do I choose DBS as my first place to have a career in? So the main reason why I choose DBS, maybe uh, the best thing is to discuss first about Indonesia digital landscape. Indonesia with its 271 million population is one of the biggest digital market in the world. Why? Out of this 271 million population, almost 70% of them are in productive age. However, it can be said that almost 52% of the grown-up people still do not have access to any of the bank product. Let's say it is the investment products or even liabilities product, even the loan products as well. And then furthermore, almost 193 million, 193 million people Outside, uh, out of the 271 million people also have already got the KTP. It means that their data are actually currently being centralized by the government and being collected by Dukchapil. It can actually change our whole perspective as a bank of how we can actually onboard the customer. Do they need to come to the branch anymore or can we actually use the centralized database to do any KYC and then onboard the customer easily to our to our bank. And then Indonesia also have one of the biggest internet user database with, uh, within the whole world, whereby around 175 million of our citizens already use the internet. Especially due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the active rate of the internet users also keeps on increasing from 3.6 hours per day back in 2019 to around 4.8 hours per day in 2020. It means that Indonesian people are tend to use more and more of the internet product currently. And aside from that, Indonesia also has one of the best uh, smartphone penetration rate in the world, uh, ranging around 70 to 80%. What does it mean? 
it means that Indonesia actually have a really strong infrastructure to support any digital initiative that will be done in Indonesia itself. For example, we are not only talking about digital banking, but also other financial technology, whereby if customer has a smartphone, they will be able to do the, any of the transaction via the mobile phone and also the smartphone easily, right? And then based on the based on the analysis done by BI and also by other institutions, Indonesia's internet-based economy is expected to reach 124 billion US dollar in 2025. It represents 5% of the GDP, which means that it is really, really huge. And then aside from increasing the inter increasing internet active rate, COVID-19 also contributed a sharp increase in the numbers of people who are using the digital services. If we're specifically talking about the e-commerce and also mobile banking industry, these two things are actually increased a lot in terms of the usage, contributing a 13.91% year on year in terms of the transaction value. It is increasing to 2,800 2, trillion uh, rupiah, whereby in terms of the transaction value, it is increasing by 42% year on year to around 514 million transaction. Is it going to stop right here? Of course, the answer is no. Because BI projected that digital digitalization will continue to develop massively, particularly supported by a more complete digital ecosystem, and also the emergence of many new players in the industry. More to these two topics later. And it is within my own belief that traditional banking is the past. With all the massive potentials that I already told you before, the future of financial industry is of course in the digitalization, which will allow customers to do any kind of transactions that they want anywhere and anytime they need. This is actually the main reason why I decided to have a career in DBS. Because back then, well, in 2017, when I graduated, there are only two banks in Indonesia who were serious enough to explore the digitalization. The first one is DBS through Digibank, and the second one is the BPPN through Genius. And the main reason why I choose DBS, firstly, is because of the it is supported by DBS Singapore. DBS Singapore is actually one of the biggest bank in Asia, which has won a number of accolades as well as the safest bank and also a market leader in the Asian market. Aside from that, it also has a digital know-how from other Asian markets not only from Singapore, but also from China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, as well as India. I believe that this is crucial because when we have a room to learn from other countries, we can actually implement what is working in the countries and implement it in Indonesia. And then lastly, DBS also have a deep commitment to digitalization, shown by its decision to move their tech development from outsourcing to in-house. I believe that this kind of commitment will make the digitalization process to be smoother and also faster. This is why I decided to join DBS at the time, because I believe that the future of banking is in digitalization, and I want to enter a bank which is most serious to develop their digital industry. And then the next question will be, where are we now? The massive Indonesian digital market not only attracts uh, banking player, but also investors of several unicorns and also several non-bank startups. Back in 2017, maybe you have only heard four, or four to five of the startups that I put in the slides. For example, like GoPay or OFO, something like that, right? However, their growth has been massive and now representing real challenges to bank due to the ranges of product that they are, they are, they are offered. In terms of payment services, as we know, currently OVO and GoPay is really big, right? But we also have competition from Dana, Cashback, Link Aja, and especially Shopee Pay. This is one of the biggest payment services that we are currently having uh, in the industry. And then in terms of loan, aside from general companies like Comcredit and Socredivo, who is offering man, uh, loan to a uh, consumer base, we also have Investri and also Amarta, who is providing loans to SME. We also have the Traveloka Pay Letter and also Credit Pintar, and may still many more companies who are entering this industry as of now. In terms of transfer, not only the local transfer, but also the remittance, which means uh, covering a transfer from Indonesia to other countries. We already have Flip, Transfest, OI, iPod Pay, TransferWise, and also Your Pay. Not to mention the other companies that I'm not listing in the slide. 
in terms of investment, it is becoming easier and easier for us to invest in gold, to invest in stocks, to invest in mutual funds, and also other investment products like bonds. We can use iPod, Bibit, Tanam Duit, Luang, Ajaib, Bareksa, and also many other companies. It means that these kind of services are not only tied to bank currently, whereby the choices are massive. You can choose any kind of application that you can find in the App Store or Play Store and do any of these things uh, as freely as you can. Not only from these non-bank startups, our competition also comes from other banks, including the so-called media digital banks, which comprise of smaller size banks, which are being acquired by a bigger size banks, or even by unicorns like Tokopedia, Gojek, Akulaku, Shopee, to penetrate the massive commercial banking markets. If you are talking about the incumbents, currently Digibank is being considered as one of the incumbents. It has been released since 2017, along with Genius as well, and tomorrow by UOB. Aside from that, 2021 will be the year where we are going to see an influx of many new players in the digital banking industry. We know that Amar Bank is going to is already launching their digital bank. There will be there will also a digital bank uh, launching from Bank Harda International. Uh, um, bank Harda International is actually uh, owned by Cairo Tanjung, and then we are also seeing BR, BRI is going to enter the industry as well through BRI Agro and BCA. They're going to develop a new digital bank through Royal Bank. It is a, it is a bank, a smaller size bank, which are being acquired by them, specifically to penetrate the digital banking industry. And then in terms of the bank with stakes from FinTech, we are having the BNC, Bank Neo Commerce. It is being acquired by... Uh, for the Royal Bank, who actually behind it, who acquired the Royal Bank recently, like you mentioned? Yeah, Royal Bank is being acquired by BCA, Pak. So currently, BCA is planning to create a whole new digital banking service through this Royal Bank. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry about yeah, I mean, the the uh, Gojek. I heard like trying to acquire some bank as well. Yeah. Is it is that is that true? Yes, true? correct. So Gojek has been trying to acquire uh, little by little the stakes of Arto Bank, and currently it has been changed the name to Bank Jago. It mm -hmm. is also planning to, to launch their digital banking service by this year. Wow. So after Gojek, uh, I'm not really sure whether the merger between Gojek and Tokopedia will happen this year or not. But mm -hmm. if yes, they will work together inside the Bank Jago. So basically, their aim is actually to create an ecosystem within Gojek, whereby customers can directly create a bank account uh, mm -hmm. from Bank Jago and then use all the services that are currently available in the Gojek platform. That's their main aim. The same thing are also being implemented by Shopee as well because the parent company of Shopee, the C Money, uh, the C Group in Singapore, they have also acquired the BKE Bank, Bank Kesejahteraan Ekonomi. Basically, yes. they are planning to do exactly the same thing with Gojek lah. They want it to penetrate. Done, is done deal or not? As far as I know, like the Bank Sejahtera, there's some problem with the Bank BKE acquisition. Yeah? Uh, it is already done, but. And then mm -hmm. since the 10 February of 2021, Bank BKR already changed its name to, if I'm not mistaken, Bank what yeah, C Indonesia C Group something. I'm not really sure about the exact name, but the acquisition has already been done. We'll update it, guys. That's the conditions in the market. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it means that we are not only facing the competition in terms of bank, we are not only facing the competition, just like what I explained from the other non-fintech industry, right? And non-bank industry, but also from other banks, as well as from other smaller banks, which are being acquired by the e-commerce. This is very important because at first, we do not see BNC, BKE, and also Bank Arto as our competitions. Because if we're talking about their size, they are really small. If you are familiar about the classification of Indonesian banks, it is being classified through buku, from buku one to buku four. Buku one representing the smallest size bank and buku four representing the big, big size bank. For example, like the BCA, like uh, Mandiri, like BNI, BRI, something like that. Mm. But currently, all these buku two banks, which are actually smaller in size and do not have a really good performance, they are becoming a target for most of the e-commerce in the industry, like Gojek, Akulaku, and also Shopee. What mm -hmm. they're doing is that they want to have the license to operate as a bank, right? Yeah. 
And if they want to apply for the license itself to OJK and BI, the process will be really long and it will be really expensive for them. So okay, what? Yes. Sorry, Jeffrey. So, uh, Jeffrey, uh, this is guy. This is why. Uh, this is very good, Jeffrey. Thank you. The Roy, why the Gojek, uh, uh, Shopee, and uh, other akulaku aku, uh, acquire like the Bank Jago or Bank BKE, Royal Bank, whatever, yeah? Because the licensing, which we're gonna discuss next, yeah. The licensing for banking licensing is still with Bank Indonesia and uh, OJK as well, yeah. But difference, okay. So the in the statements of the OJK uh, uh, in here, boss, they say if you want to do a banking, you have to get a bank license. You cannot just operate as a fintech, yeah. That's why uh, they acquire the banking. And Jeffrey has mentioned that one of the reasons yeah, uh, of this uh, why many of the fintech, the big fintech DBS, uh, digital financial services, now acquire like a bank, small even though a small bank, because they need this license. Okay, yeah, Jeffrey, thank you, James. Uh, continue. Yeah, actually, this move is also being supported by the regulator as well because uh, gradually they are reducing the capital requirement for each of these banks to operate as a digital bank. For instance, in terms of the Bank Jago, Bank Neocommerce, and Bank BKE, previously the minimum capital requirement that they need to have is around 10 trillion rupiah in order to operate as a digital bank. But gradually, they are planning to reduce the capital requirement to around 5 trillion if it is being acquired by other uh, fintech companies. For example, like this one, like Gojek and Shopee. And then after that, if it is being acquired by a bigger size bank, for example, like Royal Bank, which are being acquired by BCA, the minimum capital requirement will be even lower at 1 trillion rupiah. What does it mean? Actually, regulators are currently uh, encouraging more players to enter the industry. Because the main aim of BI is actually to develop the, uh, the financial, tech, financial industry even more in the future. They want to move to the digitalization, which is why they are developing many more initiatives like the BI fast payment currently, and also by encouraging more and more companies to enter this uh, digital industry. Because as what I explained earlier, Indonesia internet-based economy is going to be really big in 2025 and will be one of the biggest contributor to our country's GDP as well. And in order to remain relevant as a bank, as DBS, it is within the job of the planning division, my, my division job to guide and monitor the next direction of DigiBank. This, is lead, this leads to my sharing about what uh, I currently do in my day-to-day -day job in DBS. My main jobs include the preparation of business plan and also the budgeting process. This process involves a lot of discussion and negotiation process with various divisions within the banks. Not only well, within the consumer banking, from products side, such as liabilities, asset and wealth, but also to other divisions, for example, like the compliance, whereby we will need approval, right, usually when we want to launch a new product or new futures from, the, from BI and also from OJK. We also have a regular discussion with the corporate banking, for example, if we want to develop any kind of partnership, if they have a client, we are going to offer them the DigiBank service and also payroll service and something like that. It involves a lot of strategic discussion as well. And then aside from that, I'm also responsible to track the overall financial performance and also the key drivers performance. For example, how many customers are, do we manage to onboard at a specific point in time? And then how many transactions do those customers generate? And then how much of the revenue that they're bringing to the table and then how much balance they are bringing to the DG bank as a whole, and then what will be the impact to our bottom line, something like that. And to go to a further detail about what I'm currently doing in my day-to-day -day job, this is one of the most important jobs that I have. Generally, as a digital banking applications, we will have a lot of new projects and also new features that are being brought forward each year, right? However, it will be impossible to accommodate all the initiatives that we want due to two main reasons. The first one is because of the investment cost required. Building a digital banking application is not cheap at all because okay, we need please, to... Guys, are you please? Uh, everyone can see, still see Jeffrey or something? Or is it me? Okay, good. I'm freezing. Is it freezing? Okay. It's my connection, it's not yours, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so to continue what I tried to explain before, building a digital banking application is very, very expensive because we need to pay all the developers to develop the, 
the technology behind the application, right? We also need to pay them to look at the stability of the connection, stability of the application itself, how we can ensure that all customers will be able to use the application without any hitch, right? And that's why it is very, very expensive. We need to consider all the expenses that will be required to cover all the technology behind it. And also, secondly, we also need to consider the tech team capacity. As I explained to you, DBS technology is actually in-house, meaning that different with other banks like BTPN or other, uh, other banks who are implementing a digital banking service as well, they usually use outside service, for example, like in India or in other countries. But in terms of DBS, all the tech team are actually in-house, whereby they do not only deal with Indonesia market, but also with Singapore market, India market, China, Taiwan, and also Hong Kong. That's why we need to pay attention to their tech capacity as well, whether if you want to launch a 30 new features by this year, will it be feasible or not? Usually, that's the thing that we need to consider both from the cost analysis and also from the capacity analysis. And I explained before, we need to really prioritize the project and feature, right? Not only from those two things, but also from the revenue that they are going to bring into the table and also from the whole expense analysis, not only in terms of the investment cost. In terms of the revenue projections, we need to be sure whereby if we're launching a new wealth feature, for example, like if you're going to sell mutual fund or if you're going to find uh, to sell bonds, how many customers will be attracted to that kind of feature? How many customers will be able to, we, we, we will be able to acquire to use the feature itself and also to use other feature in the Digibank. How many existing customers will be interested to use such a feature as well? And then how much balance will they bring to the application? Usually the metrics that we are using as a bank is in terms of the MOB zero. Whenever we are acquiring NTB or new to bank customers, we need to pay attention. Is it a low quality customers or high quality customers? Because it is only it is always between these two sides. Whenever we are acquiring a low quality customer, for example, like customers with balance below five million rupiah, we need to play with volume, right? The more customers that we acquire into the banks, it will be better because all of them have a small number of volumes. But if you are moving the strategy towards the quality, we are not thinking about the quantity anymore. Whereby we are focusing to get a high network individuals. For example, the one who put balance inside Digibank of more than 10 millions. It relates to the strategy and also the feature as well, what we will be prioritizing to develop. And then we also uh, need to consider the number of transactions that they will do. If we're talking about a smaller, smaller balance customer, of course, the thing that we will offer to them is not related to a high class uh, services. Like, for example, like a better rate or something like that, because it will be costly for the banks, right? But what we are encouraging them to do is to do a lot of transaction so that they will generate more revenue to us. It will be different if we are targeting a high network individuals, because if we're talking about high network individuals, the transactions, even though it is uh, in a small number, but usually they are transact transacting in higher volume. That's why the marketing strategy that we need to implement is also different. We also need to prioritize as well, which one we are currently focusing in. And in terms of several products like the liabilities product and also the asset product, we also need to pay attention to the margin analysis. For example, like currently, if the BI rate is currently very low, it will be very risky for us to launch another liabilities product or to have a higher interest rate to be paid to customer at this time because it will be very costly for the bank. And then in terms of the expense analysis, Aside from the investment costs, we also need to uh, assess the impact of each of the investment that we make towards the marketing costs, the cost per acquisition, and also the cost per volume. For example, if it is very costly for us to acquire even one customer for the new feature, we are going to put the initiative in shelf because it will be very, very costly. In terms of provision as well, usually for the asset product like the credit card, like cash line, and also like the KTA or the unsecured loan, Normally, not only the revenue, but they will also bring a lot of provision to be made, especially during an uncertain times like this one because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It will be very risky for banks to simply give loan to other people, right? Because the probability that they are, they are going to be default and not repay their loan is very high. That is why it is impacting the provision number a lot during this uh, pandemic time. 
And we also need to assess the impact towards the other general expenses. For example, how many more staff will be needed to be able to cater the new products that will be developed? Do we need uh, new staff? Do we need to train them? Uh, do we have the place for them to operate in? That's the thing that needs to be incorporated towards the analysis itself to choose which project to be prioritized. And then, not only about this, my responsibility also covers the target setting and also the performance tracking of the existing product and features from both the financials, uh, financial metrics and also the key drivers, such as the net interest income, the fee income, contra revenue, expenses, operating profit, and also the bottom line. I'm pretty sure that all of you are already similar with these terms, right? And then not only from the financial point of view, we also need to track the key drivers, just like what I explained earlier, in terms of the customer acquisition, balance per customers, the expected net receivables that are being brought forward by the asset products, number of transactions, and even the active rate. Whenever you're using an application, for example, in the last 30 days and then in the last 90 days, for example, if you're using it a thousand times, actually all the companies, including DBS, are, are measuring it because we want customers to be engaged to our application as much as possible, right? This is why this, is, this active rate is very important. We want you to be using our application more. That is why we are making all the features to be more engaging and also all the UI UX to be more easy, to be easier for you to use. That is why this is one of the metrics that we are currently looking very closely. And regarding all this analysis, uh, to give you a better example, Currently, I'm also doing the impact analysis due to the declining BI rate. Uh, as you know, currently the BI rate is very low. It is being reduced again to 3.75%, whereby we still have one more, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we still have one more room to be reduced to around 3.5%. In terms of banking industry, especially to liabilities product, it is very, very bad for our business. Just to give you, just to give a simple sharing to you, if you're aware, the main uh, role of a bank is actually to act as an intermediary, right? Normally, what happens in the bank itself, there will be uh, some people who have a lot of money. They're confused where to place the money in. If not to investment product, they are going to invest it in terms of savings, right? Sorry, yeah. In terms of savings. And then in return, bank will give to them what we know as customer interest rate. For example, right, if you're having a deposit currently, we're going, we're going to give you 4.5% or 4.25% depending on the balance and tenor that you have. And then bank will actually channel the fund that you're giving to the bank to other people who needs the money in terms of loan, right? And then in exchange, these people who gets the loan will pay what is known as the FTP. Because of the declining interest rates that we are currently having, this FTP is actually being impacted heavily. And as a result, FTP, this FTP will actually act as a revenue for our bank because the revenue is declining. However, we cannot reduce the interest rate too heavily, right? Because it will make the product to be incompetitive compared to the market. That is why considering that this item will remain constant, but this item keeps on decreasing the BI, but considering that the BI rate continues to decrease, we need to consider the, uh, the, the solution to this problem. What are we going to do? Are we going to reduce the expenses? Uh, are we going to develop uh, another strategy to focus not to the libraries product, but to shift our focus to another product like the well product, for instance? This kind of analysis is the thing that I'm currently doing within my job to give a proper analysis to the top level management, what needs to be done and where to focus uh, our strategy into. It is, this is why planning division is one of the most crucial part inside the DigiBank itself. And then going to the next part, it is re uh, regarding the features that we're currently having. DigiBank currently has one of the most complete product offerings in the market. From acquisition perspective, we utilize customer's fingerprint data in Dukchapil. I explained before, uh, as 98% of the grown-ups in Indonesia already having the AKPP, we can say that all their data are being centralized in the Dukchapil, right? What we are doing is that we are generating an API between DigiBank and also Dukchapil. 
So meaning whenever you want to apply for DigiBank application, you just have to download the application itself. After that, you need to fill in several information. And then after that, you just need to meet our agents and then use your AKTP as an identifier and your thumb and your fingerprint. And then after that, we are going to send your fingerprint data and also the AKTP data via an API to the chapel. And then we are going to determine if it is the real you or not. This is why uh, I said earlier, right, that the centralized database related to the customer data in Dukchapil will really shift our perspective of how we can actually onboard the customers, how banks can do the EKYC process. And then aside from the acquisition, uh, acquisition feature, we also have a wide ranging of products uh, comprising the liabilities product, the asset product, investment product, and also the payment and also transfer features. In terms of liabilities, aside from the regular savings account and also the regular deposits, we also have other features like the tabungan maxi, whereby we are offering a better interest rate compared to the regular savings account. We also have a multi-currency account whereby customers can easily uh, buy or sell uh, foreign currency with a better rate compared to markets. And then after they buy the foreign currency, we are also providing the service whereby they can use a deposit. They can, they can put it in deposits in foreign currency, whereby we are going to give them uh, the appropriate interest rates according to what are being offered by the banks. And then not only from the liability side, but we are also offering several asset features. And one of the most prominent one is the Digibank KTA. By using this uh, feature, Digibank KTA actually offered an unsecured loan under 60 seconds for the initial approval, and the loan amount will be up to 300 million rupiah. And then not only from the asset perspective, you're also having the investment product, uh, whereby currently you can easily uh, contribute to the government's attempt to restart the economy by buying the ESBN, or currently what is being offered is the SR014. Currently, the rate that are being offered is around 5.5%, if I'm not mistaken. It is quite high compared to the current deposit rate that we are having. And then aside from the SBN itself, we are also allowing customers to do a buy and sell transaction for other kinds of bonds that are available. For example, like the ORI series or the SR series or even the FR series. And then aside from the investment services, we are also offering the payment and also transfer services in terms of the buyer bully feature whereby customers can easily do any payment in terms of the, their bills, and then whenever they want to refill their e-wallet, whenever they want to pay for their phone bills, something like that. And then aside from that, we are also allowing customers to do a transfer to, to the remittance. It is a transfer of foreign currency to a lot of countries free of charge. That kind of features that are, we are currently developing inside DBS, and then we are going to develop the feature even more in the future. And then to give a little bit of perspective of the thing that Pak Iksan uh, requests me to tell you, it is related to the DigiBank KTA. Because usually in the credit uh, world inside the bank, before the emergence of digital banking services, Every time you want to apply for a loan, you need to come to branch, right? And then after that, they will give you a pack of forms to be filled. And then after you fill all the information required, you still need to submit another supporting documents, for example, like your identity card, and then the support of your income and something like that. And then after that, it will take around one week to two weeks to three weeks to, for the ops team inside the bank to actually analyze all the application process. And then if you manage to pass the test, you will get the loan, whereby you still need to come to the bank again, and then you need to sign any kind of approval documents before you manage to get your loan. However, this kind of perspective, this, these are the kind of perspectives that we want to change via the Digibank KTA services, whereby by using the Digibank KTA, you, only need a, you, you, you will only need to input a minimum data input. The minimum data input is very, very essential for the bank to know that you are really you. For example, like you're going to ask your name, your phone numbers, and something like that, where you live, something like that. And then after we are sure we are who we are analyzing, you're going to analyze your credit worthiness. How do we assess your credit worthiness is by checking your data against our internal database, as well as checking your data in the bureau service using an API. And then after that, under 60 seconds, all the, all the analysis will be sent back to the bank 
and then we will be able to show you the initial loan approval whereby in this step, customers will be able to see the tenor and also the interest rate and also the loan amount that will be approved for them. And then after that, customers only need to complete the loan choice and also the other data requirements, the other required regulatory requirements. And then after that, the loan will be directly disbursed in real time to the customer's account. So all this process will take less than, actually less than one hour if, you, if, you, if your data is actually satisfactory. This is a massive improvement compared to the old services whereby it will take one to three weeks just to disperse your loan. Because by using this service, it is by, by using a digital banking perspective, it completely changed the process and make the process much quicker. Uh, Jeffrey, then, on step yes. number three, yeah, sorry. Uh, is, the, the initial loan approval, is that uh, something that is involved the ag uh, special ag algorithm or uh, QIC that, that, that is quite different like with the traditional banking uh, loan approvals? Can you yeah. on that? Yeah. yeah, what makes the process different is actually in number two, Pak. Because in the current, uh, because in the current um, current service that we are offering, all the credit policy checking is not being done by people anymore. It is being done by system. We already put an algorithm behind the application mm -hmm. to assess the credit worthiness based on the data that are being provided by customers. Just like what I explained to you earlier regarding the KTP, right? All the data are currently mm -hmm. being stored in Dukchapil. And then from there, we can actually use some of the data that are being inputted by the customers to assess whether, for example, have the customers applied to our banks before? What are their records? For example, if they have a CC, do they pay, uh, do they pay the charges in time or not? Something like that. And we develop a certain matrix based on a lot of criteria beside of the credit policy in terms of the uh, inside the algorithm itself. So whenever customer apply, if we are sure, for example, A is applying for the Digibank KTA, they will go through all the checklists that we are already putting in the algorithm. And if they manage to pass all the checking that we put in the system, then they will get the initial loan approval. And the checking mm -hmm. that we are doing is not only inside the bank, but also through API to a third party. So in this case, we are using a credit bureau services whereby we are checking their data uh, in terms of the credit card usage, in terms of the any kind of loans that they may have, that, that, that they may have in the future and in the past future, and how they are actually performing in terms of the payment. And by using all those metrics, we are developing a certain of a certain offering to them, comprising the list of maximum loan that they can apply to, in as well as the tenor and also the loan limit, something like that. So the main difference with the traditional process is located in this number two. Thank you. Yeah, to move on to the next uh, to the next slide, in order to face the challenges in terms of the competitions that are being there from the non-bank industry as well as from the other banks, other smaller sized banks, I believe that there will be five main keys to always thrive in this digital banking industry. One is to always focus on the customer experience because it will be useless to have the best feature in the world, but with a bad customer journey. It is like having a Ferrari machine inside a secondhand 15 year old Karimun car. People will simply choose not to use the car, right? And then the second one is to focus always on the development of the ecosystem and partnerships. Going forward, it is key not only to focus on ourselves, but also to develop ecosystem, not only with uh, other banks, but also other non-banks. For example, like the unicorns, like the Tokopedia, Gojek, it is key to actually have an ecosystem and partnership with them. Not to battle ourselves in terms of the customers, but how to integra integrate our service with them to provide a more comprehensive and also more holistic offerings to the customers so that they won't be confused by the number of offerings that they have in the markets. And then thirdly, the use of AI, big data, and cloud will also be very crucial because the better the technology that we have, the better the service that we, are, we, we will be able to serve our customers with as well. The use of big data will also help to the fourth point related to the personalization because if we manage to assess the number of data that we have, 
related to each of our customers, we can actually personalize all the communications that we make to them. For example, if we know that customer A uh, ha uh, have done a lot of bonds transaction within the last three months, we know that these customers actually uh, investment savvy, right? They like to do investment, uh, which is why we can actually match our offering to them related to the other investment product. For example, we are going to into encourage them to try the secondary bonds feature or something like that. So the key is to personalize our every communication depending on each of the customer's characteristics. And then lastly, it's, it is related to the surface automation. In order to make everything that the customers do in our platform to be better, we need to automate everything. Because if they can do the service faster, if they can do the transaction faster inside of our application, it is within our belief that they will be glued to our application and they will keep on using our application even more in the future. And I think that's it for my sharing. Maybe uh, anything that you want to ask me? Okay, guys. Based Thank you. Experience. And the exposure. Uh, I think uh, I'm gonna go first, okay? Yeah, you guys uh, better uh, prepare questions, yeah, for uh, Jeffrey. And uh, the, uh, just continuing on my uh, previous questions on the uh, in yeah, the KYC and the due diligence process. And number two, uh, you mentioned about that there is a special algorithm and using matrix and so on. But it, I'm just curious whether in the in this matrix or in this uh, algorithm it involves like some sort of like social media checking because I know like some of the vendors, some some of the uh, PPP lending or fintech lending apply or use this, uh, 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 for example, like Facebook checking, Instagram checking of the profile. Just to know, I mean, like the profile of the customers. Yeah, currently um, in terms of uh, the social definitely. media checking, we are not using it, but because what we check is more to the credit worthiness of the customers in terms of the score based on their previous performance, right? Mm -hmm. And we are also using the telco data currently by coordinating with uh, telecom cell as well. But mm -hmm. in terms of social media, no, we are not using the data because it is different because if we're talking about uh, P2P lending, some of them are using a crawling technology whereby if you... Uh, Log in, for example, into a certain uh, fintech application. Usually, they will ask permission, right, to access your accounts. Mm -hmm. And normally, if, for example, you're using your Google accounts to access your Facebook or to access your Instagram, it will allow them to actually access all your social media through the scrolling mm -hmm. devices, through the scrolling technology, which means that they can know how much you use the social media and then how much transaction do you use, for example, in Tokopedia and something like that. That's the kind of technology that we are currently not exploring yet because, mm -hmm. yeah, that's because the scoring that are being developed by those companies are actually not really dependable as well in terms of our appetite. Okay, good. Thanks. Right? That's my questions. Any other uh, questions? Uh, Michelle, Angelique, Nicolas, Rafsela, Brigitte, Calvin, yeah, everyone. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Yeah, so thank you, Jeffrey, for the opportunity. So I have these questions. So first, uh, since Digibank provide loans without co collateral, so what's, what's their main reason of seeking loans? What will they use the money for? And how do Digibank mitigate the risk of default? Thank you. Yeah, because normally if you are aware about the banking business, the unsecured loan business have already been there since uh, the old time. Many banks are currently offering the unsecured loan practices as well. However, just like what I mentioned earlier, normally the process that will be required to assess the credit worthiness of the customers will take one to three weeks because the form that they need to fill will be a lot. And then the, cost, and then the ops team, operation team, will actually assess the data one by one. It, this, that is why it is taking a lot of time for them to actually assess how much loan can they actually give to the customers. But what makes the GBank KTA different is that because all the metrics are being embedded inside the system, inside the brain, inside the application itself, whereby if any customers apply for our products, there will be a certain metrics that will be checked, right? And the process will take less than, even less than one minute, whereby after waiting for around one minute, customers will directly be able to know, oh, this is the loan that I am capable of having. 
this is the kind of that will be available for me to choose. This is the interest rate that will be divided to me by the banks, something like that. And in terms of the how banks mitigate the risk, it is of course by using a stricter uh, matrix itself. Whenever if we if we manage to filter all the bad customers from the initial credit checking in the step number two, if you remember, in the step number two process, if we manage to have a strong filter, we can be sure that the customers that we that will be given the loan will be a good quality customer, right? And if we're talking about the adverse impact, for example, like the like the COVID-19 pandemic, whereby there's a lot of uncertainty that are being brought into the table in terms of the unemployment and also other kind of things whereby customers can, our loan customers cannot work as well as they do before. Then what we do is actually to increase the provision. For example, if the customers are really cannot uh, fulfill their obligation to repay their loan, then it will be written off. That's the kind of thing that we are doing. But before writing off the loan, we also have a collection team, right? And they will actively uh, look to actually push the customers to, to repay their loan. If not possible, then we are going to discuss about restructuring with them. For example, if they want to prolong the duration of their loan for another three months, another six months, another 12 months, will it help them or not? Something like that. Because as we know, BI and also OJK are actually uh, giving the regulation as well, right? in order to restructure the loans of customers who are directly impacted by the pandemic of COVID-19. That's the practice that we are doing as well. Something like that. Is it clear enough? Uh, yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Uh, Stanley in the chat. Stanley, you want to pop up the uh, questions yourself? Yeah. Uh, yeah, what are the major factors that affects the credit scoring for an SME, for example, to apply for a loan in, DP, in DBS? Yeah, in terms of the specific requirement that we are having in the credit policy, I cannot share it with you because it is a bank specific, right? But what I can share with you is that we already have a set of analysis regarding the previous performance uh, of the unsecured loan products for the previous uh, years, five to 10 years. And then we are actually trying to generate a matrix based on this, those performance. For example, if customer A, which have a characteristic B, tend not to pay the loan, that we, then we are going to put it in the matrix. We do not have a characteristic B inside of the our, our loan portfolio. Whenever we are seeing that any customers who may have this characteristic, we are going to reject them in, the, in their application and something like that. But in terms of the detail of the credit policy, I cannot share it with you because it is bank specific. Okay, thank you. Okay, the other. Um, hi, I have a question. So you were talking a lot about um, the development and in the future for digital banking and so on. What do you think is the biggest threat to this development? The biggest what, sorry? The biggest threat? Yeah, the biggest threat is in terms of security because we are also having the same problems, right? Because if we're talking about digital banking, we're talking about the technology behind it. And whenever we're talking about technology, of course, there will be a hacker behind it. There will be a security issue. What we need to do is actually to make our system to be as strong as possible to avoid such things from happening. For example, if we're talking about the possibility, of, because you're putting all your money in digital terms, right, in the application inside your, inside your phone, what will happen if in the future your phone are being hacked, for example? Will all your money be lost and will, will it risk your wealth because of it? And that's the thing that we are always developing in order to ensure that the application will be safe enough each time you're, if each time DBS trying to release any feature, we are going to engage a third party as well to do penetration testing to ensure that our system is actually strong enough to withstand any kind of potential attack that may happen to our system. And not only in terms of the, in terms of the security itself, but also the security of our products. Because if we're talking about digital banking products like uh, BTP and Genius or even Digibank, what we are afraid the most is related to the fraudster. For example, if someone 
tries to apply for Digibank application just to make a fake account to, in order to apply for the Digibank KTA or Digibank credit card, for example. That's the thing that we want to avoid the most because the risk will be very high, right? For example, if there is a customer A who is using the data of customer B to apply for our KTA, we want to avoid that thing from happening because that means that it will be fake, right? It will be a fraud case whereby they're using another customer data to apply for our loan. So we already have a certain uh, SOP in place in order to ensure that such thing will not happen anymore. So that's the thing that the two things that we want to avoid the, the, the trap that will be really feasible for us in the future. The first one is in terms of the digital security. And the second one is the safety from fraudsters. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, just follow up questions, and I think from Amy, my following, uh, following up questions from Stanley yeah? uh, about like the, uh, the, the, the credit checking process. You mentioned about the provisions, yeah, Jeffrey, yeah? provisions for certain type of customers. The question is, uh, I mean, like, this uh, is Digibank is, uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, use or I mean, like, implemented the same uh, capital requirement as the bank. For example, like the normal bank, traditional banks, they are required to have like eight to twelve percent. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, uh, proficient ratio or the capital ratio. Now, the question is: Is the DG Bank uh, by DBS here using the same kind of uh, apa, uh, apply the same kind of rule or regulations with regard of the capital provisions, or it's just like a discretionary based on the uh, 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 the customer's profile, Jeffrey? So normally in terms of the provisions, we are looking at not in terms of the customer to customer basis, but we are looking in terms of the portfolio basis. So mm -hmm. in terms of, for example, if we're having a $3 million worth of uh, loans, we are going mm -hmm. to calculate the provisions based on that portfolio. So we are not, again, looking at the each of the customer's level at the, uh, logically. Because what we, of course, as a bank, we are tied by the regulations whereby this is the minimum uh, provision that you need to make for each of the loan that you make, right? But what we do is that we assess it by using a portfolio basis because it is the loan for customers is different from loan to corporate. If we're talking about the loan to corporate, the size will be very big, right? And that's why the regulation in terms of that is to calculate the the required the capital requirement based on the based on the each loan basis. But in terms of the customers, since the size is very small compared to the other corporate loan, normally what we do is to collab it into one and calculate the provision based on the based on the portfolio. And mm -hmm. Uh, the, for example, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, the provision that we are putting is getting much higher. The, mm -hmm. That thing doesn't only apply to DBS, but also to other banks. For example, like the, any other banks who are engaging in this kind of uh, consumer loan, for example, like DCA, something like that. Of course, there will be a spike in terms of provision as well. Mm -hmm. Do you provide like a credit as well to co corporate? Just curious. I mean, like it's only for customers of small business. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Pat, can you repeat the question? Do you provide uh, also a uh, loan or credits to uh, corporations or only like you're, you're only targeting like small business or whole, uh, uh, personal uh, loan? Yeah, for DigiBank itself, it is different because DigiBank is targeted to, customer, to consumer banking, right? Which means that it is targeting an individual user. Mm, okay. So it is different with the SME loan and also with the corporate loan because the it will be directed directly to the corporate banking, right? But we, our target is an individual customer. Thanks. Uh, any other questions, guys? We still have like four minutes. Jeffrey has to go at, I think, uh, 10. He has some um, uh, meeting as well to attend. So your last chance to ask questions, yeah? Yeah, uh, I have one more question. Okay. Yeah. It seems like fintech is way ahead than traditional banks. So I'm curious. So are fintech companies, including Digibank, are they exposed to government re regulation risk that may hinder fintech innovation? 
Yeah. yeah, that's why I think currently OJK is already uh, launching several uh, regulations right, related especially to peer-to-peer lending, which are currently booming right now. Uh, as of now, there are around 149 uh, peer-to-peer lending companies which are listed within the OJK itself, whereby 39 of them already have a valid license to operate as a company. And what I'm seeing in the future is that government are actually trying to encourage more and more players to enter the financial technology industry, not only from the banking perspective, but also from the non-bank perspective. In terms of the non-banks, they are actually encouraging them, oh, do you want to create a digital bank? Then you're going to make the regulation even easier for you. Just like what I explained to you earlier, related to capital requirements for digital banks, it is being it is going to be reduced as well from 10 trillion rupiah to 5 trillion rupiah, or even if bigger banks are acquiring a smaller banks, they are going to reduce the capital requirement to only 1 trillion rupiah. So the way I see forward is that the risk is will be there, but government stance will tend to be more supportive towards the towards this kind of impacts and also towards these digital banks to grow even more in the future. Mm-hmm. That is why I think the industry will be very congest- congested in the future and it will be very important, especially to incumbents bank like us like Digibank, to always improve and also to always introduce a new feature to make us uh, relevant in terms of the customer uh, in the face of customer's eyes. Okay. Uh, supportive or the in the words of OJK, they say the adaptive model of regulation. We kind of discuss it. Yeah, like, yeah. adaptive model of regulation, something like that. Uh, in the next, uh, in the, in the next lecture, yeah. But again, I think we're already on time. Yeah, it's ten o'clock already. Thanks, uh, your for your time again, Jeffrey. Yeah, um, and guys, for the good questions, I think it's very insightful and give us a lot of exposure about like the. process and the digital banking itself. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunities. And uh, we're going to contact you after this. But can you turn on your uh, 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 I mean, video? We're just going to take picture, yeah? Guys, uh, before we end this, like the first sessions, can you turn on all your uh, camera, please? Just going to take picture as well. One, Ahmed, Andrew. Uh, Take Madeline, so you're there. Andrew, are you there? Uh, Andrew. One, two, three. Okay, satu. Two lagi. Okay, satu, dua, tiga. Okay, that's it. We're right on spot, uh, on time, 10 o'clock. Again, thank you. Jangan kapok-kapok, Jeffrey, yeah? Perhaps next semester, or uh, uh, we're going to have you again. I mean, like, it's quite insightful, and I think it's quite... Uh, Uh, very useful for most of the uh, uh, the, uh, the students here. I mean, like uh, what you've been talking about. So again, without further ado, let's thanks uh, Jeffrey. Uh, thanks for all. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Sarisan, and thank also you, all the students for having me. Thank you. I'll contact you later on. I mean, like with the emails. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can can. Okay. Thank you. Nice thank you. Hey, by the way, Jeffrey. Yes. You- yes. Presentation with email so I can distribute to the guys your your pitch uh, that you've given to us today. Yeah, can 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 I can send it to you? Okay. Okay, thank you again, guys. So we're gonna stop here. We're gonna continue at 10:30. Yeah. So I'll already take the attendance. Thank you very much, and thank you. So I'm gonna turn off my uh, camera and meet my friend.